Beach at First Unitarian, you get to choose as much as you would like to choose. Now, I don't choose the music or choose other things. I thought Lyra made excellent se selections. But I did choose that because it's not just a passage about courage. It was given as an act of courage. Some of you might know that Robert F. Kennedy gave that those words as part of a speech in 1966 in apartheid South Africa, where he was indicting a group of university professors and government people for their role in upholding a racist apartheid system. And in that speech, which is worth reading in its entirety, he also indicts his own country for their role in upholding a Jim Crow state. So when he says, it is hard, it is a hard thing to brave the uh, disapproval of one's colleagues. He is braving that disapproval in that moment. And Nelson Mandela, who is on the cover of your, uh, I got to pick that too, uh, on the cover of your uh, bulletin here, was already in prison at that time, in 1966. We'll talk a little bit about, more about him later. Um, but the only thing I would say about Robert F. Kennedy is he uses a lot of words to describe something that might be said a little bit more succinctly, and probably, I don't know, 100 years before, Mark Twain did say it more succinctly when he said, 9,999 men out of 10,000 are moral cowards. And we don't like to talk about that because we all know it to be true. Now, we might like to think, some of us in this room, that, well, that's why we need to organize the women, right? <laughs> but I think we know it's true for all of us. So we really can't talk about, cowardice, about courage without talking about cowardice. I actually just finished reading a whole book about cowardice. Um, and cowardice and courage are kind of are, are related. I mean, not just opposites, but sort of the root words. The root word for courage comes from the Latin core, which means heart. So to take courage is to have heart. The word cowardice comes from the word, I don't know how you say this, because I don't speak Latin, but uh, C-O-U-D-A, which I think of as coulda, like shoulda, coulda, woulda, you know? But it actually means tail. And to be a coward is to turn tail and run away. It's why the cowardly lion in The Wizard of Oz always, his tail is always kind of attacking him, right? He's, the tail's always in his way because his cowardice is what is holding him back. If I only had the nerve, right, is what he says. So if 9,999 out of 10,000 of us, why didn't he just do 100? 99 out of 100. Are moral cowards, then it is worth thinking for a moment before we talk about courage about cowardice. Okay. In the words of T.S. Eliot, he says... that it is better to do evil than to do nothing. That in fact, the worst thing that we could be is a coward. And that word is kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? It's like the last thing we want to be called, so maybe we don't use it. And we say we have all these sort of ways of describing why we don't act. We even sometimes just, you know, make excuses. But T.S. Eliot says it is better to do evil and to do nothing. And in fact, in Dante's Inferno, that old book where he talks about all of the many levels of hell, 
How many of you have actually read that? I feel like there's a book we talk about. Oh, so you can fact check me, okay? I see you right back there in the, the corner with the black shirt on. I'm looking at you. You can fact check me. What's your name? Margaret, okay. All right, you got to tell me if this is true. So Dante, the, the level that he is the most afraid to go into, and he's following Virgil, right? Virgil's taking him on a tour. Okay, all right. So I'm just, I'm just, all right. I'm just, I'm just, it's always better if it was a long time ago, see, because you're more likely to think that this might be right. All right. So Virgil is giving him a little tour of all these levels of hell, right? And I know we're in a Unitarian church, so this is not about whether you believe in that or not, okay? But I think it's a useful illustration because he gets to this level where he is the most afraid. And what he sees at this level are all of these throngs of people who are lined up and they are chasing a person who's holding this huge banner and they're marching around and around but the march is a run because they're being chased by like insects and all kinds of stuff. It's horrible description, okay? And on this banner that all of these people are chasing around for eternity is nothing. It's blank. And Virgil tells Dante that the, those are the people who stood in their lives for nothing. So if 900, 9,999 out of 10,000 people are moral cowards, then we've got to look for the role models of people who are not. Because I don't want to stand for nothing. And I don't think you do either. The first time I remember seeing real courage in action was I was probably 11 or 12. I was middle school age. And I don't know what it's like in Iowa because I grew up in, in Southern California, but my cousins and I, my, my dad and his brothers, all kind of gathered at my Uncle Cecil's house in a place called Lompoc, if you're familiar with uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base is there. And, um, anyway, um, so we were in a town called Lompoc and on the, the kind of near Santa Barbara in California, Southern California. And we were visiting my uncle and my cousins and some of my other cousins were there. We have a big extended family. And uh, in Southern California, if you were not old enough to drive at that time, there were really kind of two things you could do without your parents. You could go to the movies and you could go to the skating rink. Do people do that here? And so we, I don't know, we'd seen enough movies, so we decided we were going to go to the skating rink. And because that was not just true for our family, but that was true for every family in the area, parents wouldn't let you do very much, but they'd let you go to the skating rink. We get to the skating rink, and my cousin Mary's whole school is there. <laughs> All right. She was a couple years older than me. She was probably high school. She might have been 14 or 15. And my cousin Lindsay, who was also visiting, she came with us. So it was the three of us. We go to the skating rink. We get our skates. And we sort of wade into the morass of teenagers. And if you ever hung out at a skating rink, roller skating, you probably know that the roller skating part is really not where the action is at. The action is at the snack bar where all the kids are hanging out. And, you know, there's the snack bar, and then at this particular skating rink, the snack bar was right up against this giant wall of lockers, and then, you know, those little games where you can spend a fortune trying to capture with a claw one of those really cheap uh, stuffed animals, you know, that kind of thing. So you, you get the picture, right? It's the kind of carpet you don't want to fall down on, right? Okay, all right, you got it. So we're all hanging out in the snack bar, and my cousin... Mary had spent the entire time on the way over talking to us about her boyfriend, how, how great her boyfriend was. He, she has this new boyfriend. Maybe we're going to see my boyfriend tonight. So we're sitting there at the snack bar and in the middle of, you know, this whole crowd. And suddenly, you know, kids are moving in and out. And suddenly she stands up and she goes, oh, my gosh, there he is. That's my boyfriend. And all of the kids in the room start laughing. Because my cousin, Mary, 
as a developmental disability. And my Lindsay and I looked at each other, and in that moment we realized that this was an ongoing joke, that all of these kids were playing on her. And she didn't get it. And it was like a scene from an action movie. My cousin Lindsay, in one movement, reaches out, lunges for the kid, takes him by the scruff of the neck, and throws him into the wall of lockers. And she says to him, that girl over there is my cousin, and if you ever tease her like that again, you're going to have to deal with me. And of course, I stood next to her and said, yeah, what she said. <laughs> Now, that was real moral courage from a 14-year-old girl. And I looked at my cousin, who was, you know, like a couple years older than me, and I thought, the next time that happens, I want to be her. Now, I don't know if I have the strength to throw somebody <laughs> into a wall of lockers, so I've needed to learn a different way of operating. But she was really my first role model. And sometimes we have to look even beyond our family, even beyond our circle, for people that we can emulate and think about as role models of people who have acted with courage because, uh, as Mark Twain said, there are, they are so few and far between. But we do have examples of amazing human beings who've had tremendous courage and wisdom. And one of them is the man who was on the cover of your bulletin, Nelson Mandela, who showed great courage not just once in his life, but many times. He had the courage to burn his identity papers, an act of resistance against the apartheid government. He had the courage to endure years of imprisonment and captivity. He had the courage to get to know his captors and his enemies. And at the end of all of that time, there's a great story in his autobiography, The Long Walk to Freedom, about how in 1976, so this would be at least 15 years before he was released from prison. In 1976, there was a prison official who came to him and said, why don't we just take you out of this prison and retire you, right? Send you to a nicer place. And he said, well, I'd be happy for you to do that if you'll get me a meeting with the Minister of Justice. And they said, oh, well, we probably, we may not be able to get you a meeting with the Minister of Justice, but why don't you just retire, right? Because they were under a lot of pressure internationally. There was a lot of pressure on the government to, do some, to release Nelson Mandela. So they're thinking, maybe we can just make this go away. And he had the courage to say, not if I can't get that meeting with the Minister of Justice. So when they, and he stayed in prison, and when he, they came back to him in the late 1980s, over 10 years later, that was his same answer. But this time, he got the meeting with the Minister of Justice and began the negotiations that led to democratic elections in South Africa. Nelson Mandela is often revered for his ability to forgive. That's what people always say about him, right? That his greatest strength was the, his ability to forgive. And I think that that just sells his memory short. What is so incredible to me about his legacy is that he was able to face the world as it was, without shrinking back in fear. He was able to find ways to act in the midst of just incredible fear. In prison at Robben Island, Nelson Mandela was known to be an avid reader. He had like a library in his cell, and he would keep all of these books and read all the time. And one of the books he spent a lot of time with was The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman emperor. 
Uh, but most importantly, because I don't really think that Mandela was trying to learn to become an emperor, he was a follower of the philosophy of Stoicism. Now, the word stoic, we think that that means to be devoid of human emotion. That's how we use it today, right? It's almost kind of like an insult if you say somebody is stoic, right? They're unfeeling. Maybe that's just me. But stoicism was actually a philosophy that was about facing the world as it is and in the midst of dealing with the realities of the world, practicing the cardinal virtues, courage, wisdom, justice, and temperance. And I kind of think maybe we need to reclaim the word stoicism a little bit, what it means to be a stoic. We don't have to use that word, but what it means to really face the world as it is. Because I heard today a little bit of that in the reading that the Amos core team did. The Des Moines as it is. In the Des Moines as it is, the streets here are worse than the streets in Washington, D.C. In the Des Moines as it is, we have people who have had their houses flood three times in the last 20 years, even though they're not next to a creek or a river. Does that concern you? Does it? Now, I got to tell you, I read this quote, and I read it to my spouse as I was preparing for this, and he didn't really think it was a very useful quote. But I'm going to try it anyway, okay? This is from a guy named Epictetus. Don't worry about his name, but he was a Stoic, and he says... What would Heracles have been if he said, how am I to prevent the big lion from appearing or a big boar or brutal men? What care you, I say, if a big boar appears, you will have a greater struggle to engage in. If evil men appear, you will free the world from evil men. So let's do a little survey. How many of you understood what that meant? Anybody? Okay, so I'm going to make a go at explaining it. All right? I think what Epictetus is saying, Heracles was this hero, right? And who would this hero have been if he said, if he said how do I prevent bad things from happening? How do I prevent the big boar from attacking us? How do I prevent brutal men from coming? And Epictetus says you shouldn't be worried about how to prevent bad things from happening. You should be ready to act no matter what happens. Is that making a little more sense? And I've got to tell you one of the hardest things, well, it's hard and good. One of the hardest things about being an organizer right now is it's like all of a sudden everybody feels like we need to change things. Like the world just broke on November whatever, 2016. (laughs) And I'm not trying to say it doesn't matter who's in the Oval Office. It matters a great deal who's in the Oval Office. So don't get me wrong. But did the world just break in 2016? Because I don't think that somebody's house being flooded three times in 20 years and nothing being done about that has anything to do with who's in the Oval Office. I don't think that the fact that we've got roads that are like Washington, D.C., whether, I mean, I haven't been on the roads in Washington, D.C., so I don't know. But I do see a whole lot of potholes. And I don't think that has very much to do with who's in the Oval Office. Because it was like that before, wasn't it? And so I feel like What I'm afraid of, and I hope that I'm wrong, and I think that I am wrong, but what I'm afraid of is that we've got a whole lot of people who might be thinking, like that person Epictetus is criticizing, who might be thinking, can't we just fix this so we can go back to the way it was before? 
when we were comfortable and we didn't have to worry about these things? Why are we so afraid of bad things happening? Why are we not more concerned about how to be ready when they do? Because that's what courage is about. Courage is not about making a world so everyone can be comfortable forever. Courage is a virtue. It has to be learned and practiced. The Stoics said, not once in a lifetime, but every day. Because every day, in big and small ways, we do not know what is coming. Now, the point is not to depress you. The point is to say that courage can be learned. And in fact, it has to be learned. We're not born courageous. It has to be learned. And in Amos, a part of what we're trying to do is to create the kind of organization where people can learn and practice that kind of courage. I think that maybe First Unitarian Church, that you're trying to be that kind of organization. If I read your seven principles of Unitarian Universalism, you can believe that, but it doesn't really matter. There's lots of people who believe in the seven principles, and on Sunday morning, they're sitting at their coffee table reading the New York Times. You're here. So the difference to me is not whether or not you believe it. It's do you want to practice those principles in day-to-day -day life. And to practice those principles takes a community of people who want to learn together. There's an author named Massimo Pigliucci who wrote a book called How to Be a Stoic, which if you're interested, I would recommend. But he says in this book the following. But what about ordinary life where people hardly have to face such extreme situations or display such levels of courage and endurance as people like Nelson Mandela? It's a good question, but the answer is simple enough. It is by hearing about great deeds that we not only become inspired by what human beings at their best can do, but we are also implicitly reminded of just how much easier most of our lives actually are. That being the case, it shouldn't really take a lot of courage to stand up to your boss when your coworker is being treated badly, no? I mean, the worst that can happen is that you'll be fired, not put into solitary confinement and tortured. How difficult is it really to behave honestly in the course of everyday life, since we are not risking military defeat? And yet, imagine how much better the world would be if we all did just display just a little bit more courage, a slightly more acute sense of justice, more temperance, and more wisdom each day. Hearing about people like Stockdale, Mandela, Lincoln, and others helps us put things into perspective. That is, to become slightly better human beings than we already are. Or in the words of the reading you had earlier today, to become someone who says, I am someone. <laughs>